like to begin my talk by asking a question. And it's perhaps a question that, in my view, is not asked often enough. And the question is, what is the promise of democracy? The promise of democracy for which so many have struggled for so long in this country, in Hungary too, perhaps many of you here in this room. The struggle that brought millions of people out into the streets in North Africa and the Middle East in the last two years and to this day. What is it about the promise of democracy? One of my favorite writers, one of your countrymen, Imre Kertész, has written so powerfully, so persuasively about the failures of alternatives to democracy as they've been lived here and in so many other countries. So what is it in democracy? It's uniquely seductive appeal. At the risk of oversimplifying, I'd like to just examine two central features of democracy, the promise of democracy. Number one, that democracy promised an equality of opportunity. That is, that everybody would be able to choose to live the lives that they wanted to live. And number two, that those who govern would be answerable to those they governed. In other words, leaders would be answerable to their people and, and not the other way around. So let's just think of these two assumptions, however simplistic they might be, and see how well we fared. And here I'd like to quote another favorite author of mine, this time a German Jewish literary critic, philosopher, and essayist, Walter Benjamin. And I'd like to use this quotation as a kind of guide as we explore this question of the promise of democracy. So Walter Benjamin writes, there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. So let me just say that again. Benjamin writes, there is no document of civilization that is not at the same time a document of barbarism. Now, of course, many of you might be thinking, what is she talking about? What does barbarism have to do with our civilization, especially sitting in one of its most beautiful creations, this gorgeous hall? But I would like to say that one of the reasons we have a difficult time examining our civilization according to that maxim is that we found unique ways of concealing our barbarism, of concealing the silences on which this civilization is built, both linguistic, political, social, journalistic, so that the word barbarism, I mean, when was the last time you even heard it, right? You never encounter barbarism anywhere anymore. So the word appears distant, as though it applies to another place, another time. Certainly not to us, and certainly not to this time or this place. But is that really true? Of course, it's true that it's obvious that we would want to celebrate our civilization. Never in the history of humanity has the world offered such extraordinary wealth and productivity and opportunity, such a seemingly endless array of pleasures and fun and enjoyment and well-being. All of these things are absolutely true. But this is not what I'm talking about. When I say barbarism, I speak to you of the underside of this civilization. I speak to you of the silences on which it is built. I speak to you of the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the refugee, the slum dweller, and countless, nameless, faceless others. Just a few facts. More than half the world's population, that's three billion people, live on less than two euros a day. One billion people live in slums, and in 20 years, that number will double to two billion people. Meanwhile, 40% of the world's wealth is controlled by 1% of the world's population. And this is to say nothing of all those people increasing in number and more and more invisible who languish in one of the more insidious constructs, our prisons, as I speak today, there are 10 million people in prison all over the world, almost a quarter of them in the country in which I live. The United States, which most people know around the world rightly as the bastion of democracy and a torchbearer of democracy in so much of the world. Now, where I work, um, Democracy Now!, which is an independent news hour based in New York City, 
Our job is to find ways of telling stories of the underside of this civilization, to try to speak to peoples whose voices are absent or simply silenced. We go to where the silences are, we try, it's not easy, we try very hard to get those who are not given an opportunity to speak to allow them to speak. And we did this most recently because just a few days ago marked um, the US invasion of Iraq, the 10-year anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq. So last month, on February 15, 2013, was the 10-year anniversary of the largest protests in the history of the world. People all over the world, a large number of them in democratic societies after all, came out into the streets in protest. They were protesting what they knew would be the impending invasion of Iraq, but believing in this democratic ideal of theirs, where leaders are answerable to their people. They came out in droves and they said no. But then what happened? Something happened, but not what they wanted. The war began on March 20th. The invasion commenced, and that war continued for almost a decade. Now, what does this say about the people who govern and how they perceive those whom they govern? What does it say even more about all the people who died in Iraq, all the people who died in the US, and who continue to die? The story we've been told about this war, because of course the story has been told again and again, is that the war was won, a terrible, awful dictator was ousted, a democratic system of government was installed, and the last US troops left the country in December 2011. Now, all of those things may be true, but what are the stories we're not being told? Because the war has ended, it now, this story has been relegated to the back pages of newspapers, practically a footnote to larger political events in the region. The stories we are not told as much. In Iraq, so much infrastructure was destroyed that the World Health Organization considers 25% of Iraqi children to be stunted. The use of depleted uranium was so widespread that it has guaranteed that Iraqi children for generations will be born with the most ghastly birth defects and the country will suffer from unprecedented cancer rates. That millions of Iraqis who were displaced both in the country and outside of it have still not been able to return. And in the US, the story is not much better, and it's also scarcely reported. And that is that now more US military veterans die from suicide than from combat. The latest US government reports that there are 18 suicides a day by US military veterans. So if we think about that, that means by the time this conference concludes today, 18 US military veterans will have killed themselves. So I want to turn now to a story which may seem, at least initially, unconnected. But I'm going to make the case that it's absolutely connected to what we allow to happen, to the stories that we're allowed to listen to, and the stories we're prevented from listening to. And it has to do with the kind of underlying prejudice that enables certain lives usually those who are excluded, usually those who are silenced, allow those lives to be lost, more or less with impunity. I was at a, at a media conference a few years ago at a, in a former Soviet Republic. The idea of the conference was to bridge East and West, to especially uh, kind of bring together what appeared then, and perhaps appear even now, to be unbridgeable differences, especially, as the conference organizers explained it, between Islam and the West. So I was sitting at a, at a dinner table, uh, it was a beautiful spring evening, lots of wine, lots of lovely food, etc., with Canadian, uh, sorry, with North American policymakers and diplomats and European aid workers and journalists, and we were talking about all manner of things. Somebody brings up the question of suicide bombing. And a lot of people express surprise and wonder and shock and sadness at this practice, which after all, in probably all of our lifetimes, has 
begun to occur in more and more and more places with more and more and more violence and destruction. So, as we talk about suicide bombing, someone, a human rights worker, who in fact has worked at that point for many years in a war-torn country, also coincidentally, or maybe not even so coincidentally, a Muslim country, she says, well, um, I guess Muslims simply do not value human life the way we in the West do. So everybody first is silent and then starts telling their own anecdotes. Everybody tells their own stories and then everybody comes to the same conclusion. All the evidence points in the same direction. Muslims simply do not know the value of human life. Now, this might be a completely trivial example. You might be thinking, who cares? People chatting, chit-chatting at a dinner. How can you say that an opinion expressed in a casual setting has anything to do with wars being waged, lives being lost? But I would say to you, actually, it, it, does, it does matter. It doesn't ma to express a prejudice of that kind, no matter how delicately, no matter in how genteel or civilized a setting, it does matter, and it does affect the capacity and the ability for all of us to tolerate a situation where, after a decade of crippling sanctions, which left half a million Iraqi children dead, another war was waged, and so much violence and so much damage was done, and it was allowed to be done. There is a connection between one prejudice, between prejudices of certain kinds, and the ability to carry out certain actions in the world, more or less with impunity. And I would only add that in a world which we're all more or less accustomed to now, one could say even inured by, in a world of aerial bombardment, drone warfare, secret renditions, a world of increasing poverty, inequality, starvation, incarceration, I would only want to ask the question of who is untainted by the accusation they do not value human life. Who among us is not complicit? Are you? Am I? I mean, there's after all a reason that Dostoevsky wrote such a long time ago that the prison is the measure of civilization. Or writing several decades later, Danish-American journalist Jacob Rees said, the slum is the measure of civilization. Whatever the measure of a civilization, we cannot reliably expect to receive it from those who are its beneficiaries, those who gain from the civilization in whatever form it presents itself. We must listen to those who suffer as a result, the slum and the prison, what Dostoevsky and Jacob Rees said. They are the people who suffer as a result of civilization. They do not benefit from it. So, the question would arise then, what is there to do? What should we do? I mean, what a catastrophe, right? No, but I think the crucial thing is that all of us, all of us here in this room, and of course I include myself foremost as well, I don't see myself as at all exempt from this, that we must listen for the silences. We must try to hear voices of the excluded. In every story of our civilization's really unprecedented achievements, we also must look for the comparable stories, truthfully and simultaneously tell the stories of the catastrophe and barbarism that also exist. Because only in doing so can we allow this civilization to truly live up to its promise as civilization, as a democracy, which is inherent to the concepts, and one that we can share collectively as a collective human project. All of us, all of those who are excluded, all of those who we do not listen to. And if we begin to do that, if we're able to do that, we can start to ask ourselves the question of what kind of world we might create and what it would mean if all of us were able to listen to translate the stories we are told and the stories we aren't told. Thank you. Thank you.